So last time we just started chapter 5 and we were looking at the definition of convergence of sequences in R to the D. I've asked for quiet and there's still a lot of talking going on which will slow us down, which will not be a good thing because the module gets difficult later and we need as much time then as we can get. So the sequence xn converges to A if and only if the sequence of distances, distance from xn to A, gives you a sequence in R plus which tends to zero in the usual sense as in last year. And we had a, another definition in terms of epsilon and n, which is quite useful. And we'll have another definition in a minute. And what I warned you is that if you use this alternative notation about limits or xn tends to a, that doesn't count as a definition of convergence because it's not, it's not helpful. It's just an alternative notation. If you're asked the definition, you have to go back to the definition given above or one of the alternative equivalent definitions, including one that's coming up in a minute. So that brings us on to another one of my inventions. So here's a, a concept that didn't have a name in the literature, so I've given it one. There are some very related terms that are standard, but this particular term, absorption of a sequence by a set, is, as far as I know, my invention. That means other lecturers won't know what you're talking about if you use it. But I found it's quite a useful tool when you're trying to understand how sequences really behave. I won't dwell on it too long here, but we'll come back to it um, in chapter 9 when it will be very important and help us in dealing with this quite tricky concept when you've got sequences of functions converging to another function. So what does it mean to say that a set absorbs a sequence? Well, it means that from some term on, all terms of the sequence have got to be in the set. So the first few terms, it doesn't matter whether they're in the set or out of the set, as long as eventually the sequence gets stuck inside the set. And of course, that means it'll happen from some term onwards, say there's some big integer, big positive integer, capital N, so that for all little n greater than capital N, and of course, implicitly, that means integers, little n, all the terms from that point on should be stuck inside the set A. So here's a little picture of something that might happen. A might look like this. And your sequence might have terms, it might look like this. X1 might be outside, X2 might be inside, X3 might be outside. and so on, you don't know where they are, but eventually, from X capital N onwards, they're all in the set A. Now, they don't have to converge to anything, but from X capital N onwards, all remaining terms of the sequence will be stuck in the set A, even if they may move around inside the set A. If that happens, then we say that uh, the set A absorbs the sequence, and we actually say that it absorbs it by stage capital N. So if you want to say when did it absorb the sequence, you say it absorbs it by stage capital N, means that all the terms, x capital N, x capital N plus one, x capital N plus two, they must all be in the set. Some of the earlier terms might be. And I'm not saying that's the earliest stage. If you absorb it by stage N, you also absorb it by stage n plus 1. So if you absorb the sequence by stage 10, you also absorb it by stage 100, because all the later terms are in as well. So how does this help us? Oh, well, OK, what's a standard term for this? Standard terms for this in the literature are xn eventually lies in A, or at most finitely many terms of the sequence outside A, or at most finitely finitely most finitely many terms of the sequence are in A complement, um, and so on, various variations. But there's an advantage that we'll see, to phrasing it my way, it actually turns out to be a grammatical advantage. 
You make the set the subject of the sentence, and you say the set absorbs the sequence instead of the sequence is eventually in the set. And that helps in one of the later definitions. For more on this, if you look at my blog, you'll see why I've introduced this term. Um, I haven't introduced it for uh, no reason at all. I have found that it helps. Okay, so, um, so if n satisfies that condition, as I said, we say that A absorbs the sequence by stage n. And then, if it absorbs it by a given stage, it absorbs it by later stages, for the reasons I mentioned already. Also, if A is contained in B, if A is a subset of B, well, if a smaller set absorbs the sequence, a bigger set must as well, because you get stuck inside. As soon as you're stuck inside the smaller set, you're stuck inside the bigger set as well. Here's A. Here's B. And here are the points that are stuck. Xn, Xn plus 1. And so on. They're all stuck inside A, so they're stuck inside B as well. So if A absorbs it by stage N, so does B. Here's a little exercise for you. A little extra exercise. Show that if A intersection B is empty, then they can't both absorb the same sequence. This is a proof by definition. I'll probably put it on my proof by definition sheet. So it's impossible for both sets, A and B, to absorb the same sequence. The same sequence XN. I'll put that on my, one of my proof by definition sheets. I'm putting together a whole load of uh, straightforward proofs that you can practice your proof techniques on, which will go on an optional question sheet, which I'll make available. Any questions so far? Any questions about absorption? I don't want to spend too long on it, as I say. It won't be so important to us now, except that you could use it to practice a lot of things to do with proof and maybe understand sequence convergence a bit better. Let's go on. Here's a particular example. Minus 1 to the n over square root of n. Now, this hops up and down around 0 on the real line and it tends to 0 from either side and gets closer and closer to 0 as you go. In terms of using the term absorption, that suggests that if you take a little, a little interval around the origin, um, it, should eventually, it should absorb this sequence by some stage. Then you can say, which stage? And of course, you can do an exact calculation that uh, if you want to get it to stay within a thousandth of zero, you've got to get n at least 10 to the 6. And once you get n, little n to be at least 10 to the 6, you're OK. So for little n that's at least 10 to the 6, xn will be between minus 1,000 and 1,000 inclusive. Because uh, I'll remind you that uh, 1,000 is 10 to the 3. So with our terminology, we've got that that means that that little interval absorbs this sequence by stage 10 to the 6, a million. If you make a smaller interval, you'll have to go further along, but it'll still absorb the sequence as long as you leave room on either side of zero. If you, if you made the mistake of only having an interval one-sided next to zero, it wouldn't catch the negative terms. So it has to go both ways from zero. And somehow, this fits in with our notion of convergence. I won't give more details there. Uh, I think I can leave you to check the details of that.
So you can now redefine convergence using absorption. And this is on one of the question sheets for you to check this. This is proof by definition again. The sequence converges to A, that's if and only if, no matter how small an open ball you take centered on A, it still must absorb the sequence. But of course, as you make the ball smaller, it'll probably absorb it later. But it doesn't matter how small a ball you take, a small open ball will still absorb the sequence, no matter how tiny. So, if you take epsilon to be 10 to the minus 9, so that you can't really see that the points aren't at the point, <coughs> that little open ball, radius 10 to the minus 9, has still got to absorb the sequence. So after a while, the terms have got to get stuck in there. And here's where you get the grammatical advantage you can say every open ball centered on the point absorbs the sequence. If you express that the other way, you end up saying the sequence is eventually in every open ball, but that's ambiguous. Because it isn't eventually in every open ball. It's for every open ball, the sequence is eventually in it. So I prefer it this way around. OK, I think that's uh, probably enough about absorption for now. We'll come back to it in chapter 9, and there's lots of stuff on the question sheets. So, suppose you've got a sequence in R to the D. Well, that's a sequence of vectors. Vectors in R to the D have got D coordinates. So we might need some notation for what's going on. Let's use this notation, as good as any other. The nth vector, xn, has got coordinates xn1, xn2, up to xnd. Well, that not, they're not being multiplied. Those are, and also, this is not a subsequence or anything like that, which is going to come up in a bit. No, this is simply, those are just d real numbers, the d coordinates of the vector xn. And the first n in the subscripts is just telling you that it, they're coming from the nth vector. Now what you could do is you could write these down in the columns or in the rows of a very long uh, matrix. Let's, uh, let's have a look at this. We could do, let me write down x1, x2, x3, and so on. And um, that's, let's not, let's not bother with the brackets for the moment. You've got xn1, uh, sorry, you've got x11, x12, up to x1d. You would normally put brackets around it, but I'm not going to bother with that for the moment. x21, x22, up to x2d. So, of course, we've got x3, 1, x3, 2, up to x3, d. And then if you go further down, somewhere down here, then, you get to xn, which is xn1, xn2, up to xn, d. You can put round brackets around them if you like. And, of course, it goes on forever. Well, what do you get? Uh, well, this is what you get when you look at them sideways you've got the coordinates of these vectors. But you could also go down the columns. And if you go down the columns, you get infinite sequences going down the columns, and you get D of them. So you get a sequence of first coordinates going x11, x21, x31, and so on. That's actually that's the dots. There's a sequence of second coordinates going x1, 2, x2, 2, and so on. There's all the ones in the middle. And there's a sequence of d coordinates at the end, x1, d, x2, d, and so on, all the way down. And as you can see, then, you've got one sequence of real numbers for every coordinate from your sequence of vectors. So 
So the sequence of if coordinates is um, xni, where n runs from 1 to infinity, which is equal to x1i. X, OK, well, let's, let, I don't need the bracket for this one. It's, it's this sequence, x1i, the, the i coordinate of the first vector, x2i, x3i. That's the i coordinate of the third vector, and so on. And that gives you the sequence of i coordinates here i is some number between 1 and d. So you fix one of the i's, and you look at the i's coordinates, and that gives you a sequence. And now the next result tells you that, uh, and we won't bother with the proof. If you go back a few years, you'll find I did include the proof in the notes, but it's not a very exciting proof, so I I won't bother with it. But you are supposed to know this result and be able to apply it, and we're going to do an example in a minute where you do apply it. And what it says is, if you want to check convergence in R to the D, it's the same as what I call coordinate-wise convergence. A sequence of vectors in R to the D converges to a given point if and only if each of the coordinates converges to the relevant coordinate of the target vector. Let's have a look at that. So you've got a sequence in R to the D, using the same notation as we had above. And now you've got a point A in R to the D uh, with coordinates A1 up to AD. Then the sequence XN converges to A if and only if for every I in 1 up to D, numbering the coordinates we're going to be looking at, that sequence of i coordinates that we were looking at a moment ago must tend to the i coordinate of A, and then tends to infinity. You can write that out in full. And then tends to infinity. The first coordinate of the vectors tends to the first coordinate of the target vector. The second coordinates of the vectors tend to the second coordinate of the target vector, and so on. And the last coordinate, the deep coordinates of the vectors xn, must converge to the deep coordinate of AD. So that's uh, coordinate-wise convergence. For each i in uh, 1 at the d, uh, the sequence of i coordinates of xn must converge to the i coordinate of a, the target vector. As I said, we won't prove it. Um, that, the proof of that is not examinable as book work. You can find it. It's actually not, not a hard exercise anyway, but it's not an interesting proof. So you'll be, allowed to you'll be allowed to quote that unless you're in a question which asks you to prove it. So let's come to an example then for you to look at. And now I would ask you to do this with full justification. That means justification just as you would have used in G11 ACF. So you're allowed to quote standard results from G11 ACF if you've got them. You're going to be using things like the algebra of limits, the ratio test, things like that. And I'm going to give you a few minutes to have a go at this. And you have to quote the result we just had, along with stuff you know from ACF, and determine the limit of this sequence with justification. I'll give you a few minutes to think about that, and I'll come around and see how we're getting on in a minute. Meanwhile, I'll pause the recording here. Right, so you've had a chance to think about this, and at least some of you have figured out what it converges to. So, first of all, we know that convergence is coordinate-wise convergence, so all you have to do is check the first coordinates and the second coordinates separately.
So since convergence in R squared, being a special case of R to the D, is coordinate-wise convergence, we check the first coordinates and the second coordinates separately. So the first coordinate is relatively easy, and we, do, we deal with these coordinates just as in G11 ACF, as we would have dealt with the last year. However, it would help if I had a copy in front of me before it disappears. Ah, here we go. Okay, so, so first, consider first the sequence, the first coordinates. Which was xn1 which is n over 4n plus 2. And doing this as in uh, G11 ACF, you divide top and bottom by n, so that's 1, over 4 plus 2 over n, dividing top and bottom by n, which tends to 1 over 4 plus 0 equals a quarter, as n tends to infinity, by the algebra of limits. That does the first coordinates. So then you have to look at xn2. xn2, that's 3 to the n of n factorial, and that's a slightly trickier one. Who knows the uh, name of the appropriate test to use to deal with this one? Ratio test, excellent. Okay, so we'll use the ratio test. Um, we have xn2 is not equal to zero for all n, that's a good start, otherwise you have to be careful with the ratio test. And we'll have a look at mod xn plus 1, 2 over mod xn2. That's 3 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial divided by 3 to the n over n factorial, which is equal to exactly 3 over n plus 1, which tends to 0 which is less than 1 as n tends to infinity. This is exactly how you'd express it from uh, the way you do it last year. So what's going on? The limit ratio exists, and it's a number less than 1. So by the ratio test, the sequence converges to 0. Now, if you don't like messing around with xn2, which is a bit ugly, you can always rename that as another sequence and work with that. So xn1 tends to a quarter, xn2 tends to zero. So xn um, tends to limit n tends to infinity xn1 limit n tends to infinity xn2 equals a quarter zero as n tends to infinity. And that does that much. 
Of course, if either of the sequences hadn't converged, then it wouldn't be a convergent sequence. Coordinate-wise convergence means all of the coordinates must converge, and they must converge to the target vector's relevant coordinate as well. Any questions about that example? You might want to go back and revise the, uh, the things I did that came from D11 ACF from last year. Now, here's a useful fact from last year that I'll remind you of. Uh, if someone gives you a sequence and you don't know if it converges or not, and you're trying to prove it converges, one useful way to do it is to sandwich it between two other sequences which you do know converges. But that only works if you know that the s sequences you sandwiched it between both converge to the same limit. Um, you don't get much information if the sequences you sandwich it between converge to different limits. So in the sandwich theorem, then, you sandwich a sequence Bn between two other sequences, a sequence An and a sequence Cn. So they're stuck in between. This is for real numbers here. An less equal to Bn less equal to Cn. Now An attending to A and Cn attending to A as well. That's the same A. It's very important that's the same limit. So if the two sequences on the outside tend to the same limit, then the one that's stuck between them has to converge to that limit too. That's a surprisingly useful theorem for something that looks completely obvious. And what's, what's really good about it is that you can use it in circumstances where you didn't yet know whether being converged or not, but you managed to trap it between two things you did understand, then that sometimes shows that being converges when you really didn't know in the first place. Now, we won't do it, but you can generalize it to work in R to the D if you, if you do it right. Uh, but I won't say anything about that here. I'll let you uh, think about that as an exercise. Oh, well, I've already said it's an exercise, so there you are. See if you can figure out how to generalize it. And I won't say any more about that here. That's going to be very useful to us in a bit. Now, our next task is to try and boost up the algebra of limits. Now, we've got an algebra of limits in R, which you're allowed to quote, but we don't yet have an algebra of limits in R to the D, and that's our next task. Now, we won't prove all of this. We'll prove one and two, and you get to do number three on a question sheet. Now, there's lots of different ways to prove this, but it does require a proof. And a few years ago, I remember asking in a mathematical analysis exam, prove part one of this. And people wrote, by the algebra of limits, the limit of the sum of the sum of the limits. But this is the algebra of limits. So what people were saying was, by the algebra of limits, the algebra of limits holds. In the same question, I think I asked something like number two, and they said, by the algebra of limits, the norm of the limit is equal to the limit of the norms. And in other words, they said, by the algebra of limits, the algebra of limits holds. Um, no, you can't do that. What you could do is quote the algebra of limits in R to help you prove the algebra of limits in R to the D. That would be doing something. But we won't do it that way. We'll do it another way, um, as you'll see. Uh, but there's lots of different ways to do it, and you can use the coordinate-wise convergence method to give you quite a neat proof of part one. So if you want to do part one using first coordinates, second coordinates, third coordinates, and the algebra of limits in R, that's fine. Um, part two, you can do again using coordinate-wise convergence. You'll have to quote something about the square root function, but that's um, a reasonable quote. So again, it's an alternative proof structure, which we won't use today. Part three will be on a question sheet. So let's note what we've got. We're assuming x is turning to x and that y is turning to y. 
And we're going to start by proving that xn plus yn tends to x plus y. And we're going to do this all with a triangle inequality. So for one, we're given that uh, xn tends to x and yn tends to y as n tends to infinity. And we're going to use the sandwich rule to help us look at xn plus yn. Consider, well, we want to look at the norm of the difference. xn plus yn minus x plus y. We've got to show that tends to zero. That's the definition of convergence that we're working with. So we've got to show that these non-negative real numbers are converging to zero. We must show this sequence converges to zero in R plus. So let's, we could even write it as a sequence. It goes from n equals one to infinity. We can show this sequence Converges to zero in R plus, or in R, in the usual usual sense, and we're going to use the sandwich theorem. So how does this work? We have naught is less than or equal to the norm of x n plus y n minus x plus y, which you could rewrite. As equal to the norm of xn minus x plus yn minus y. By the triangle law, that's less than or equal to the sum norm of xn minus x plus norm of yn minus y. So that's by the triangle law, or the triangle inequality. And that tends to zero plus zero equals zero. Uh, by, well, because xn tends to x, and yn tends to y, that's the definition of convergence. And by the algebra of limits, of course, in, in R. since xn tends to x and yn tends to y and then tends to infinity. And implicitly the algebra of limits in, in R as well. So what do we do? Let's just pull that back. The sequence we're interested in lies between zero, you can figure that as a constant sequence zero, and another sequence that's tending to zero. So your sandwich between two sequences that converge to zero, and by the sandwich rule, that tells you that you converge to zero as well. So by the sandwich theorem, that sequence tends to zero and then tends to infinity. as well. And that's exactly the definition of xn plus yn tends to x plus y and then tends to infinity. The distance to your target limit tends to zero. So that does that one. Uh, part two is very similar. But I'll quote a standard result from the first question sheet. Quote a standard result.
that the modulus of norm A minus norm B is less or equal to the distance of A to B. That's from first question sheet. And if you quote that standard fact, which you're allowed to quote, the rest is not too hard. So now, let's have a look at... Uh, we are given that xn tends to x as n tends to infinity. And we have to investigate the modulus of norm xn minus norm x. Why are you doing that? Because we have to show that the sequence of norms tends to the norm of the limit, norm of x. So you have to look at how far away is it from the norm of x, and the answer is it's the modulus of the difference. We're talking about a sequence of real numbers here. Norm of xn is a real number, and we're asked to look at that sequence of real numbers and ask, does it converge to x? That means you have to say how far away from the, sorry, the norm of x. You have to say how far away is it from the norm of x, and the answer is it's the modulus of the difference. So we have to show that this tends to zero in R and then tends to infinity. And we'll be using the sandwich rule, of course. So we have naught is less root to the modulus of the difference. But that's less or equal to the norm of xn minus x by the standard fact we mentioned above. And that tends to zero as n tends to infinity by the definition of convergence of the fact that xn tends to x. So it's another sandwich. Naught on the left, norm of xn minus x on the right, which is also tending to zero. So the figure in the middle has to tend to zero as well. By the sandwich theorem, um, that figure in the middle tends to zero. So if the modulus of the difference tends to zero, then tends to infinity, that means that norm of xn tends to norm of x as n tends to infinity. And uh, that finishes the bit of the proof that we're doing. As I say, part three is on a question sheet. Any questions about that proof? Now, the last result of this chapter, of course, I'm not going to prove today, but I'll just tell you something about it. It's a sequence criterion for closedness. We've got a definition of closed which says that the complement of the set should be open. But in practice, that's not always the easiest condition to check, especially in an abstract setting. Sometimes it's nice to be able to work with sequences. And it turns out that closed sets have got various other characterizations. Another, another characterization of closed set that we won't do in this module is a set is closed if and only if it contains the whole of its boundary. Boundary was done in the last examples class. A set is closed if and only if it contains the whole of its boundary. A set is open if it doesn't meet its boundary at all, if none of the boundary points are in the set. So that's another characterization you can use. In terms of sequences, 
A set is closed if and only if no sequence of points in the set can have a limit that's outside the set. So it's impossible to use limits to escape from the set. Generally, you can, um, as we'll see in some examples next time. I'll show you some examples as to how a limit can sometimes get you out of a set using a sequence that's in the set. Okay, we'll stop there for today.